Before the break, we were discussing the possible capture methods for Mars's atmospheric carbon dioxide, depending on which devices are capable of grabbing onto a 6 millibar atmosphere to collect 1,483.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide daily, which they will then have to somehow store until it can be refined and processed. As calculated on aquacalc.com, 1,483.3 kilograms of CO2 is 33.71 kilomoles of the gas. On Earth, at room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, with atmospheric pressure of 1,013 millibar, 33.71 kilomoles of uncompressed carbon dioxide wants to expand to 807.9 cubic meters. With a different online calculator, located at chemicool.com, we can see how gases would behave in a Martian atmosphere given the number of kilomoles. This is the ideal gas law formula, PV equals nRT. Pressure times volume equals N, the number of moles worth of a gas, times R, the ideal gas constant value of 8.3145, times the temperature in Kelvin. This online ideal gas law calculator lets you input values using different metrics for volume, pressure, and temperature, and does the conversions for you in order to find whatever value you are missing. In this case, we're looking for volume. On Mars, where temperature averages minus 60 degrees Celsius, with atmospheric pressure of 610 pascals, that same amount of gas would occupy 97,932 cubic meters, or approximately the value of 40 Olympic-sized swimming pools. To reduce the volume and keep it steady, there would need to be a system in place to regulate both the temperature of the gas and the pressure, both of which are going to require more energy to facilitate. Splitting those carbon dioxide molecules gives us carbon atoms and twice as many oxygen atoms. To create methane from this, the two oxygen atoms per carbon atom need to be replaced by four hydrogen atoms, and there is sweet bugger all for hydrogen in the Martian atmosphere. So where is that going to come from? Water, H2O, is supposed to provide that raw resource to this process. Let's start by addressing the volume of water that scientists think, keyword think, is on Mars. Nobody knows for sure, and the number is constantly being revisited and revised. We know, using best practice, that on Earth we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,386,000,000 cubic kilometers of water. On Mars, scientists think there's about 5 million cubic kilometers of water ice on or near the Martian surface. These 3D spheres represent, to scale, the water estimate of each planet with the sphere radius marked in kilometers. Maybe there's more water ice to be found, maybe less, but there is no liquid water on Mars. The lack of atmospheric pressure would cause liquid water on a surface to evaporate instantly. So this resource may have to be mined and transported as ice. That ice would likely be contaminated with extremely fine toxic dust and perchlorate salt. So the ice would have to be melted down into water and then distilled before it could be used in any production process. Certainly possible to do, but it would require more equipment and that equipment again requires energy to run. Water will actually provide two elements for the propellant synthesis, hydrogen for the methane and oxygen for the LOX tank. Water is H2O, with oxygen weighing 16 atomic units and hydrogen weighing only one. For every volume of H2O, oxygen accounts for 89% of the mass per volume. And while the oxygen is required by the ship, it's the hydrogen we need to make methane with. Four hydrogen per carbon atom, making up 25% of the methane mass by volume, and we need to create 534 kilograms of methane daily. But hydrogen only accounts for two of the 18 atomic units in the water molecule. Oxygen accounts for the other 16. So a quarter of the methane harvest quota, 534 kilograms, is 133.5 kilograms. Then we apply the eight to one ratio from the water molecule, and we find that we would have to harvest 1,201.5 kilograms of water per day to capture the hydrogen that they need. 1.2 tons of water might not sound like a lot. After all, it's less than two of these totes worth. In terms of pickup trucks, that equates to less than three half-ton payloads. But there aren't any F-150s on Mars. And something, or someone, is going to have to move the water, or ice, to the processing plant. It needs to be said that there are seasonal pockets of surface ice on Mars, but those locations are generally at the poles of the planet which would be the exact wrong landing site if you're powering your equipment with solar power. As with Earth, Mars has a similar planetary tilt, which gives the planet seasons much like Earth, so there are periods over the course of a year where those poles would get very little sunlight over the course of a day. And mining the ice might prove a little trickier than people think as well. 
The most efficient way, of course, would be using machinery such as drilling rigs, but this machinery would have to be powered by high voltage electricity and suited to the conditions on the Martian surface. Since the visible surface ice is located at the poles and the colony would likely not be, they could wind up having to dig down in the hopes of hitting a pocket of solid ice to use something like a Rodwell system as shown here. This sends hot water down one pipe into a pocket of ice, melts the Martian ice around it, and pumps back colder liquid water. This paradigm requires a drilling rig, a pump assembly that works under Martian gravity and atmospheric pressure, and a heating source for the water, all of which will also have to run on electricity. We know it takes 4.2 kilojoules to raise the temperature of one liter, one kilogram of water, by one degree. Every day they'll need to harvest 1,201.5 kilograms of water. But how much would the water ice need to be heated before it could be pumped to the surface? Special thanks going out to Gutza1 and Karthik S, two of our Twitter followers for helping out with that question, which was not the easiest to answer, due to the fact that water on Mars has a triple point, right at zero degrees Celsius, where solid, liquid, and gaseous water are all equally stable. To keep it as a liquid, the water would have to be warmed higher than zero degrees and kept under pressure to get it firmly into the green patch of this phase diagram. Call it 10 kilopascals of pressure and 15 degrees Celsius. Using this Rodwell warming method, according to another online calculator at omnicalculator.com, just to warm the ice up from minus 60 Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius would require 628,781 kilojoules or 175 kilowatt hours of energy just to heat the water to pump it out while under pressure. Then once it's brought to the surface, the water has to be kept under pressure and heated until it can get to the processing site where it would still need to be kept under pressure and heated until it can be purified or distilled. If there's no surface ice or easily accessible pockets of ground ice, well now you're talking about digging up hydrated minerals in the soil to hit your daily quota, which is the worst case scenario. Not only does moisture comprise a mere 2% of the Martian regolith minerals, they would have to heat those materials to 200 to 500 degrees Celsius to release the water molecules from 60,000 kilograms of Martian dust instead of 1,200 kilograms of Martian ice, which means mining 60 tons of dirt every day. A typical dump truck can haul about 14 tons, so four dump truck loads daily on a planet that doesn't have dump trucks and colonists would be working in a pressurized EVA suit the entire time, even if they're using hand tools, picks, and shovels. If colonists have to resort to this method, they might as well not even bother and just enjoy the remaining days as best they can. But let's say the colonists happen to hit an ice nugget mother load. After they've mined, hauled, melted, and purified this 1,201.5 kilograms of water, the molecules still need to be broken apart because the Sabatier process doesn't use water. It uses hydrogen and produces water. The basic premise of electrolysis, creating hydrogen and oxygen gases from water, is extremely simple. All you need to do is add enough energy in the form of electricity and the water molecules break apart. The question is, how much energy? To force the two hydrogen atoms away from the oxygen atom in the water molecule, the system requires 260 kilojoules of energy per mole of water, putting the energy requirements to split a liter of water into the two gases at 16 megajoules or 4.4 kilowatt hours. 1200 kilograms or 1200 liters of water need to be electrolyzed daily, so 4.4 kilowatt hours times 1200 kilograms is 5280 kilowatt hours or 5.280 megawatt hours. That's 440 kilowatts per hour for a 12 hour cycle, requiring 1,835 solar panels, assuming the solar panels would always produce peak power during the day. And at 21.3 square feet, two square meters per panel, that's a minimum footprint just for the panels of 3,670 square meters, or roughly one acre of panels, weighing approximately 44 tons. Alternatively, that's 12 nuclear reactors if they're running a 12-hour duty cycle. At the end of the daily processing cycle, they would have collected 133.5 kilograms of hydrogen gas. Going back to the AquaCalc website, we can work out that 133.5 kilograms of hydrogen gas contains 66.22 kilomoles of hydrogen, and on chemicool.com, that says at 610 pascals, at minus 60 degrees Celsius, the uncompressed gas takes up a volume of 192,378 cubic meters, or 
77 Olympic sized swimming pools. Then that gas needs to be kept in pressurized storage until it's ready to enter the Sabachi reaction chamber. So we finally have the raw ingredients ready for the Sabachi process, pure carbon dioxide gas and pure hydrogen gas. The Sabatier process requires that the chamber be heated up to 400 degrees Celsius and the pressure of that chamber needs to reach 30 bar. We don't have an estimate on the amount of energy this process is going to require, but there is a way to come up with an absolute minimum requirement. Every day the colonists have to produce 534 kilograms of methane, and the amount of specific energy stored in methane is 55 megajoules per kilogram in terms of electricity equating to 15.28 kilowatt hours. 534 kilograms would therefore be 29,370 megajoules or 8,160 kilowatt hours. Spread across a 12 hour day, that would be 680 kilowatts per hour. 680 kilowatts divided by the 240 watts each solar panel can produce at their peak give a required total for this process alone of 2,835 solar panels. At 21.3 square feet, 2 square meters per panel, that is a minimum footprint just for the panels of 1.4 acres or 5,670 square meters. At 47.4 pounds, 21.5 kilos per panel, that's 134,379 pounds or about 61 metric tons just for the panels. If they're running 12 hour production cycles. However, if they plan on running around the clock, since solar panels don't work in the dark, the number of solar panels would need to at least double so that half of them or more could charge up a battery farm that would allow for operation at night. If Musk plans on using NASA nuclear reactors for the task, he would need to buy and bring along 17 of them if running a 12-hour duty cycle just for this process. Once the daily cycle has run its course, colonists will now have to deal with the end products, the refined methane and oxygen gases. We find that at one standard atmosphere, at room temperature, 534 kilograms of methane gas has an uncompressed volume of 963.9 cubic meters. We also discover that 534 kilograms of methane, whether gaseous or liquid, contains 33.29 kilomoles of these molecules. As a liquid, it only occupies 1.26 cubic meters, but cryogenic methane must be kept chilled at minus 161 degrees Celsius or around 100 degrees colder than the average temperature on Mars. Moving to oxygen, 933 tons of pure liquid oxygen in 500 days is 1,866 kilograms per day. At one standard atmosphere, 1,866 kilograms of oxygen gas takes up a volume of 1,305 cubic meters and contains 58.31 kilomoles, whether as a gas or liquid. As a liquid, it only occupies 1.64 cubic meters, but it must be kept chilled at minus 183 degrees Celsius, or about 120 degrees colder than the average temperature on Mars. But if you think those numbers are high, wait till we move them to Mars. To find the volume of 534 kilograms of methane gas on Mars, we take the 610 Pascal atmospheric pressure, average of minus 60 degrees Celsius, 33.290 kilomoles value from the previous calculator, and we discover that 534 kilograms of methane on Mars wants to expand 100 times from 963.9 cubic meters to 96,712 cubic meters, roughly the volume of 39 Olympic-sized swimming pools. To find the volume of 1,866 kilograms of oxygen gas, we can take the 610 Pascal atmosphere, average of minus 60 degrees Celsius, 58.31 kilomoles value from the previous calculator, and we discover that 1,866 kilograms of oxygen gas on Mars wants to expand 130 times from 1,305 cubic meters to an uncompressed volume of 169,398 cubic meters, roughly the volume of 68 Olympic-sized swimming pools. This is what the Martian colonists will have to produce and store every single day for 500 days straight in order to be able to launch the ship back to Earth. 39 Olympic-sized swimming pools of methane gas and 68 Olympic-sized swimming pools of oxygen gas they will have to compress and chill to liquefy, then keep chilled and under pressure until they load it on the Starship for departure. Compressors take energy, refrigeration takes energy, and what tanks would they be storing this in in the meantime? So to summarize this entire process, after landing on Mars, in order to process methane and liquid oxygen from resources available on Mars, 
Colonists would have to set up an array of solar panels measuring several acres in size, or bring an appropriate number of nuclear reactors to power a multi-stage processing plant, every component of which they'll have to bring with them. They'll have to capture the CO2 from the extremely thin atmosphere using extraction fans or scroll compressors or whatever else will work, and keep it stored in an appropriately sized pressure vessel. They'll need to mine ice and melt the ice to purify the water to remove sediment and perchlorate salts, store the water as a warm pressurized liquid until it can be electrolyzed into hydrogen and oxygen, and then those two separated gases would have to be stored in separate pressurized vessels until the Sabatier chamber is ready to process the day's efforts. The Sabatier process would then take the stored carbon dioxide and hydrogen gases, heat the mixture up to 400 degrees Celsius, pressurize the reaction vessel to 30 bar across the nickel catalyst, and milk the processor for methane and water. That water could possibly be cycled back into the system, but would have to be electrolyzed again for the hydrogen. The processed methane would have to be kept chilled and under pressure in yet another vessel, unless they are foolishly planning on loading it right into the Starship. And it remains to be seen if the Starship is even equipped with a refrigeration system capable of keeping these cryogenic propellants chilled and under pressure. If it is equipped with such a system, every kilogram of equipment and coolant required would dig into the payload capacity of the ship. Now to be perfectly clear, Musk has stated in the past that his intention is for the first starships to bring what he describes as a small propellant plant that would be expanded over time into a larger facility on future missions. However, what we have described in this episode is the smallest possible facility that would allow colonists to return to Earth after 500 days on Mars. Although this episode dealt with the in-situ fuel creation requirements for Starship, mainly because that ship is the only one being promoted as a Mars colony delivery system and return vehicle, the same requirements would be true for any vehicle making similar claims on Mars or on the Moon, where the biggest differences would be the sun's irradiance on the surface and the presence of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Of course, the way the Moon rotates, no matter where you are positioned on the Moon's equator, you'll get sunlight for 15 straight days out of 30 to power solar panels. Then you'll need 15 days worth of stored energy before the sun comes back to your patch of dust to start powering the cycle again. And this episode of course dealt with the creation of methane. Would be entirely different and a far simpler process if the vehicle only required using electrolysis to split water molecules down into hydrogen and oxygen to power the craft. Coincidentally, those are the two gases being used by the SLS engines. But as we've seen recently with SLS, hydrogen can be a tricky gas to work with. Being realistic, since this requirement is essential to Musk colonization dreams, upon which he continues to conduct further funding rounds at SpaceX, until Musk can present a working demonstration on Earth of a system that can be carried to Mars on Starship to produce the propellants his ships require in quantity, his ambition to send a million people to Mars by 2050 has absolutely no gas in the tank. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic and for the continued support of this channel both on YouTube and through our Patreon account, where our patrons are supporting future productions directly. Heading into fall, we're going to be changing up topics on a more regular basis, and we would appreciate you liking the video, sharing this link, and subscribing to the channel so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.